Hi, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a uh, Horace's American conference. And our section, the topic is uh, pursue a purpose to rebuild trust. And uh, we have a great Our speakers, panelists, we have a great group of panelists. First, let me introduce uh, Brad Hansen. Okay, hi, Brad. Brad is currently global head ethics, and risk and compliance strategy, innovation, and corporate functions. Brad joined the Novartis in 2006 and worked in many countries, including Germany, Thailand, and current Australia and currently in Switzerland. Most importantly, he uh, actually uh, recently, he and his team led a development and launched a new code of ethics in 2020, which, is, which was created by uh, associates and uh, anchor in the behavioral science. I think we'll be very interested to listen to um, Brad's uh, story about you know, sharing on uh, his case, and then maybe you start first, and then we'll, other speakers will, will follow with your uh, comments. Go ahead, Brad. Did, will you introduce everyone else, or shall I just jump, jump You in? first, and then each, each one by each one, yeah. Okay. And then we have, uh, yeah, you, you first. Okay, great. Thanks, Sonny. Look, um, it's, it's great to be here on the panel on such an important topic. And so um, I, I thought I just might start by sharing a little bit of my own perspective and then kind of linking it back to a little bit of the work that we've been doing in, in Novartis. But I do believe that there's only one way to really integrate purpose into a corporate organization, and that's to make sure it's built into the strategy and that you have clear goals and targets that the organization is willing to, to openly commit to. I also believe that companies with a stronger corporate purpose maintain stronger connections with their customers, in our case, with our patients, and also with our people, our associates. And therefore, we're able to deliver a more resilient and sustainable financial performance. If I think about this in the context of Novartis, our strategy and business model is really designed to help us deliver on this purpose and to create value for both our company, but also for society. And you can see this very much reflected in our strategy. One of our fifth pillars, sorry, the fifth pillar of our strategy is about building trust with society. And to build trust with, with our stakeholders, it's critical in order for us to be able to deliver on our purpose, as well as our long-term financial performance. And I believe our, our purpose is very much a social one. And it's really the reason why I joined Novartis 15 years ago. Um, we reimagine medicines to improve and extend people's lives. I lost my mother when I was 15 to, to lung cancer. And I remember for two years um, watching what this did, of course, to my mom, but also to our family and thinking that there must be a way to cure something like this. Like, I, I, I never want that to happen to anyone else again. And that's really why I joined this industry and it's very much linked to the purpose of Novartis. We, we discover breakthrough therapies and aim to deliver them to as many people as possible. So if I, if I just talk a little bit more about that fifth pillar, we have a, a very clear strategic path on how we want to deliver that. Um, and it's centered really around four focus areas. The first is very much holding ourselves to the highest ethical standards. And Donna, you mentioned the code of ethics. This was one of the foundational programs that we launched to really live up to, to, to this. And one of the commitments we made internally and externally. Second is really being part of the solution on pricing and access. And this is a very alarming statistic, but according to the World Health Organization, one quarter of the world's population, this is more than 2 billion people, have no access still to basic medication. Then, and the third is really being part of addressing some of these global health challenges. Low-income countries are fraught with the burden of infectious and chronic diseases, but now they're also facing a global pandemic, which is COVID. 
The fourth is really about being a responsible citizen. Society, which, which I'm a part of, we're all part of on this panel today, increasingly expects companies to take a stand on global challenges such as poverty, social justice, climate change, um, and other complex issues. We all have a responsibility together with governments to contribute solutions to bigger societal problems. Um, and this also includes like our, our sustainability objectives. And so maybe I'll just stop here, but I'm also happy to share particularly a little bit more on COVID, but we can get into that after the other team members introduce themselves. Okay. So excuse me, uh, Brad, uh, Derek, Derek, can you hear me? Derek, can you speak? Because we uh, have another speaker who is going to, uh, haven't able to join us. Uh, let me, let me see whether he can join. Brad, uh, uh, Derek, can you hear us? Can you hear me? So he maybe may not able to, uh, to, to share. So one hour speaker. Let, let me introduce our second uh, panelist. Oh, Sally, maybe. Sally, there, are you? There he is. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Let Let me introduce an, our another speaker. Is Derek? Derek, can you hear me? Maybe next later. Sally, are you Are you ready? Sally, then let me. Uh, Stephen, let me introduce you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's uh, in introduce the next uh, speaker, uh, Stephen Scott. Um, Stephen, after a career in uh, investigating intelligence and risk management, Stephen founded a starring a U.S.-based uh, rich tech pioneer. Starring allows firms to identify a mighty great organizational risk to drive performance optimization proactively. He's, <clears throat> he's a uh, predictable behavioral analytic pr platform Focus behavioral train among staff to assess how they will impact mission critical operational outcome. With the intuitive actionable insight it provides, the running encrypts a user to leave from the front foot. Okay, Stephen, please share your thoughts on the topic. Thanks, Donnie. Um this is a this is a very broad topic, and there's a number of different places where, where one could jump off. Um, I'd like to pick up on the theme of trust and and build on some of what Brett just shared. And um, forgive me for being a little bit academic about this, but uh, I think I read somewhere that the topic of trust has more social research papers in peer-reviewed journals than any other topic. Um, it's it's hugely important, and it's very very poorly understood. I think people have an intuitive sense of I trust someone, I don't trust someone. But, but what leads to the decision to trust? And I'd like to talk a little bit about that and then tie it in with, with the concept of, of firm purpose. So trust has both cognitive and affective components, right? It's from the heart and it's from the head. When we take the decision to trust someone, we're, we're putting ourselves in a position of vulnerability. If that person fails to act in the way that we expected, we can suffer some sort of harm. And so in, in trying to get comfortable with that, we look to assess whether or not we think someone is competent, right? I mean, a plumber may be a terrific plumber, but I'm not sure I want him doing brain surgery on me. Mm. So you know, do you have the competence to do the job? And then the second sort of cognitive piece that's important is, are you reliable? Um, if you're competent but unreliable, that doesn't really help me. And if you're reliably incompetent, that doesn't help me very much either. So I need to make sure that I have both of those those things in place. But then what comes in is, is this gut check. Um, do I feel that you're honest with me? And do I feel that you're benevolent towards me? Right? You've got my best interests at heart. And if you have all four of those pieces, I think you're competent, I think you're reliable, I think you're honest, and I think that you've got my best interests at heart, then I feel comfortable putting myself in the position of vulnerability that is involved when I trust you. Now think about how important that is with a brand. I mean, this is the famous story where someone was poisoning Tylenol and, and, uh, and, and the company took all the 
emptied the shelves at a tremendous cost because they knew that if they had to be honest, they were very transparent about it, and they had to show that they had everyone's best interest at heart. And by acting as quickly as they did and as decisively as they did, they showed competence and they showed reliability and trust in the brand. And if you look at what's happening in the world today, there's just countless examples where there, that's not the case. All right, we can talk about the Max 7, uh, the seven crashes with, with Boeing and people were, were purposefully cutting corners and I mean, we still haven't gotten to the bottom of that. Or I'm not trying to beat up on Boeing, but they've been in the papers for acting in a way that is at a minimum not reliable. And then if you look at what happened with opening false accounts at, at Wells Fargo, that at minimum doesn't sound like you have my best interest at heart. And if you then look at, um, I mean, we can we can pick any number of, of, of other scandals. But the, the point is companies today have been uh, acting in a way that is very much so focused on driving profit to the company and more so to specific individuals who are in positions of power and privilege who take decisions to act in a way that is maybe completely contrary to their own morals and values and ethics outside of the workplace, but they get into the workplace and they suddenly start to act in ways that they themselves often have a hard time explaining. And so one of the questions that, that we asked in Starling and that led to the, the creation of this business is, is there some way to get insight into that so that you can anticipate behavior and, and take corrective measures before problems arise? so that you can demonstrate greater confidence, greater reliability, greater honesty, greater benevolence. And we think that there's huge value to be unlocked in doing that. So this is a commercial proposition. It's not a feel-good sort of rainbows and unicorn idea. It's about really driving customers to your business. Employees will leave your business if they feel that the business is not trustworthy. So, so let me let me pause there. That's just a, a few thoughts for me on trust, and we can we can dive into any of that. But let me now tie that into purpose. Um, this is a topic that's been getting a lot of attention in the last year, and again, it's one that I think is not as well thought through as, as it could be. Um, if you want to look at an organization that has a very clear purpose and really terrific enforcement mechanisms to make sure that every member of the organization acts in keeping with the organization's purpose. The mafia is a terrific example, right? But their purpose might not be necessarily one that society would celebrate. But if you're running the mafia, you very much like the fact that people police one another, and if someone acts in a way that's contrary to the purpose, they get, they get shot, right? They disappear. So it's a very effective organization, and there's things that we can learn from that. Uh, and there's been a... a, a quite a bit of research into precisely that topic. Um, and, and so when I look at a company and I ask, what is your purpose? It has to be more than making money. I mean, making money, there's a lot of ways to make money. Um, so why does someone set up a business? What is it that you set out to do? And I thought that Brett did a really great job of explaining why he was personally called the new artist, right? He had a personal mission to try and make a difference in the world. And he looked for an organization that could help him amplify his own capabilities in that regard. And I think that that's sort of a, a big part of what we have to, to focus on in, in organizations is why, why do you exist in the first place? And then is, is that purpose really genuinely believed by the employees of the organization? And then can we trust them to act in the so just just some high level thinking for me, but that's that's sort of what motivates what we do at Starling. Very well said. Okay, great. So uh, we have uh, Derek and Brewster join us. Let me introduce uh, Derek. Derek Brewster is a CEO of a chief executive for corporate purpose, where he's had the effort to engage coalitions of CEOs who believed a company's social strategy, how he engaged with key stakeholders, including employees. Communities, investors, and customers determine company success. He has 30 years of a corporate executive experience in U.S. and abroad, including officers with Fortune 500 such as Nabisco, Kraft, and was a uh, 
10 around CEO for Krispy Kreme. He's a, have a, and then Derek, you have a, I think you are very qualified to talk about the topics because you are in the business. Please. Great. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Very clear. Good. Showing my that you talk about that after time, uh, many yeah. minutes on the on the area, but it's really okay. great to be with you all, and great to hear the uh, the comments from from Brett and and Stephen to open open things up here. It's uh, very 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 helpful. At CECP, um, our last name is Purpose, and we were founded a little over twenty years ago to really help the world's leading companies to be a force for good in society. So we're the good purpose, not the mafia purpose. If, if, if <laughs> <laughs> and it, it's it's really uh, key because what we're seeing is a lot of talk about uh, purpose uh, among major media. It's mentioned at least 35 times a week, the talk of purpose. Uh, but we think it's important to understand it, what it is, uh, why it's important, and how you might Im- embed that into uh, into an entity and organization. Um, we just finished research on the return on purpose. So we looked at companies that we had high purpose. I'll come to define that in a bit. And those that are low purpose. And as uh, Brett said, the high purpose companies outperform. They do better in the marketplace. They attract better employees uh, and they create value over time. Uh, so we, we think those are really key. But purpose, I think, is sometimes misunderstood. You know, everybody uses it in different terms and different words. And we've identified four key criteria for purpose. First, you need to have one, right? And you need to have one that is not just <laughs> you but it's about the broader world. Um, and, uh, you know, we have some from like J&J to positively impact human health through innovation. I mean, that's the credo of, of, of J&J. Um, or Walmart. You know, we save money so people can live better. Um, so that's the first area. The second area, it has to be longer term in nature. It's not one time. I, I, my purpose is to come here or there. Um, this is the business's why. Right. It's the raison de try, as the, my bad French would say, the reason for being why we really exist as an entity. And it needs to have time to have a presence over time. Third area is it needs to resonate with the key stakeholders. Right. I mean, who you're really trying to connect with uh, very much, as, as, as Stephen was saying, you know, you, you got to be connected to those you're going to serve. You got to have, have those the, the areas. Um, and the other piece is it also needs to be embedded within the organization. Um, an opportunity. We're seeing the result of this among business because we think more businesses today are purpose driven than they had been previously. We've just seen this in the global Edelman trust barometer. Uh, citizens around the world were, were, were asked who's their most trusted institution. Media down and low. Government low. Nonprofits not bad. Business most trusted institution now. And that has only increased here, I think, over the, uh, the the COVID time frame. And businesses are trusted because they're competent, as we've said. They're also adaptable. They change in a dynamic and changing world. And they're seen increasingly as ethical. So the comments that we're here really all tie together. And business as a whole, pretty trusted. My business, my local company, my local CEO, trusted even more. Mm-hmm. But to embed that into the organization is not easy. Different organizations go in different ways. But at CCP, one of the things we've done is really asked our companies, we have about 220 around the world, Novartis is one of them, is to really identify, to develop, and to communicate to key stakeholders a sustainable long-term plan that incorporates your purpose, but also how you're going to live it, right? Your business strategy, as well as your ESG strategy. How do you engage with stakeholders and the rest? We've now had, uh, we've run eight of these, these forums. We've had help 40 CEOs share their long-term plans. We have a ninth coming up in Biopharma uh, in June. We have about nine uh, CEOs who are, who are committed to share from, from Moderna, from Pfizer, from J&J, uh, GSK are all part of that area to share that long-term plan, that public format. Uh, and we think that's a way, once you've done that, you're out on the on the lip. Everybody now has to line up in the organization, and then companies can be held accountable for it. So we think that's really a guiding principle: is that purpose? You know, what's your progress? But also, tell me about your plan, and then you got to go deliver on it. So thank you. It's such a, an honor to be part of this panel and actually get connected here with with you all. <laughs> thank you, thank you, um, uh, Derek. Now our last um, our panelist is uh, Sally Sally Miller. Sally Miller has been a um, a a very successful business lady, a business woman, and a, a investor. Um, she's a 
partner and president of, of, of many uh, startups. He recently he's a he's a invest a, like a first investor and angel investor for uh, for a twenty billion uh, fund equity funds. So and then pur purpose.com building movements and prepares the largest scale impacting two billion people. So he invests in many many startups. You know I just give you a, a few names: coocean.com you know, and such such on take. Trusty care, and so on. So she's a, is a, you know, like a first hand investing for goods for you know, for goods for profits. I think you know she have a good story to tell. And welcome, uh, Sari Miller. Hi, um, thank you very much. This is this is a a really stellar, very impressive group. Um, about, I have a, a classic uh, a Wharton MBA. I have an investment banking corporate finance experience as well as being president of a company with 1,200 people um, and, and um, have done a lot of uh, merger and acquisition work. About 13 years ago, uh, coming as we knew into the recession, I had started working, looking for startups with impact, but are for profit. And I'm the first angel investor in LeapFrog Investors. And we were only two, because we begged and borrowed our way for about a million dollars of legal and, and office space and, and advisory. And LeapFrog um, set out to prove that you didn't have to sacrifice financial for social returns and vice versa. And it's a for-profit fund and many miracles happened and we raised the first fund considering we had no fund experience and the founder, Andy Cooper, never worked for a for-profit and had he never had any finance experience. He was a PhD, had worked at a nonprofit. Leapfrog Investments today is over $2 billion. It just announced another $500 million um, um, from Tomasek and um, we serve our portfolio companies service 212 million people, but more importantly, uh, over 186 million are low, low income, earned between two and ten dollars a day. So there's a very interesting understanding of trust here, because we our main product is micro insurance. We felt that the poor could not. Um, we felt that the poor um, needed a safety net, meaning there's many reasons for poverty, but a lot of those who are impoverished really rise up the scale. And when they have an untoward event and it affects them, could be for a generation. So we actually built our business on microinsurance, and now we've expanded in terms of, you know, micro health insurance, micro life, uh, property and casualty. Um, the second business that I was the the uh, founding angel is purpose.com and purpose is um, its foundation is on building social movements for good. So part of building engagement is very key in terms of trust. During COVID um, we pivoted, we, a lot of our clients went on hold um, and we pivoted um, and went to the UN to which we have a strong relationship and we proposed the concept of verified to, to disperse legitimate and true information about COVID and now about vaccines. So that was initially a $5 million campaign and we're in the middle of our second $5 million campaign. So part of having purpose, I think a, a very important linchpin is trust. Um, and I would say that when I look for a deal one of the, uh, which is early on and it's unproven, both the entrepreneurs and the business plan, I've got to feel a, a strong sense of trust and integrity and like total commitment. The purpose has to pervade all these deals. So thank you. So she disconnected. 
<laughs> so maybe, oi? Yeah, no, I, I can yeah. hear you. I don't oh, know. Oh. I didn't, I didn't, if you'd like me to continue, I can continue. Can you please, please okay. continue. So codeocean.com is about reproducibility. And um, uh, there's a huge problem globally that you can't reproduce these studies. I'm sure you see it at Novartis. Um, and we have a platform and we're agnostic to what software you're using or what is on your computer. And it comes down in a Docker and you actually have data sets and algorithms and you can easily collaborate within a company, which is often siloed, but also with other companies, with researchers and you know, universities. And it's reproducible and everybody can look at the data. So we are, that's beginning to take off, particularly during COVID, because a whole bunch of research was done through new tools and new companies and new new collaborations. So that that has been actually uh, very successful during COVID. Another company, I'm the founding investor, <laughs> I advise in all of them, so I take a very active role, is Biotia, B-I-O-T-I-A dot I-O. And that is a company that has the largest pathogen database in the world. And it, we are able to, through second generation sequencing, uh, diagnose, diagnose what, what, what pathogen somebody has. So typically, which is a huge worldwide problem, somebody goes into the hospital, three days later, they're running a fever and you can't, and they come in and swab you still in American hospitals. And, and they say, well, we don't really know. It'll take a day or two days or a week. And they put you on some sort of antibiotics. Using Biosha, um, we're able to determine in less than 24 hours, usually the range of pathogens that somebody has, whether it's bacteria or viruses. We pivoted during COVID in that we developed a COVID test kit, which is more, it's not determining uh, whether or not you have COVID, it's determining the exact variations. And the German government has said, we need to get these kits to figure out, you know, what, what are the variants that are in the population? So that's also taken off, even though it had a, you know, things sort of stopped during, during COVID. We also came out with some COVID initiatives where a company I'm a founding investor is called Hyro. H-Y-R-O, and it's a natural language processing company. And just the latest the latest uh, product that we launched was that all these hospitals and, med and physician offices are getting inundated with how can I get a vaccine and, and so on and so forth. And we developed a product that um, takes, takes a caller or somebody even online through a series of answers and seems to be very successful in terms of getting the information or even scheduling appointments if they're available. So um, anyway, I've involved in uh, companies. Some of these companies are women led. So I've looked at, uh, you know, gender based uh, investing as well. And um, they're all over the place. What's interesting about my companies is that people approach me they're in uh, renewables, in uh, donation as a service, and so on. I think I should stop here. <laughs> okay, so um, maybe uh, 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 Brett. So you, would you mind elaborate a little bit more on you know, especially what the recent development, you know, your development in how the, the new development in the new uh, process of uh, you know ethic. Uh, COVID ethics in the Novartis. Maybe you can share a little bit more in that. Yeah, sure. Look, I, I think we're on a continuous journey and we continue to, to look at ways to continue to evolve our, our program. One of the key highlights for me, and it's probably a highlight also for me in my, in my career, was working together across the organization to develop a new code of ethics, which was designed by our associates for our associates 
And we took a very different approach in how we developed this. And I think this is why it resonated so much with our people. We, we learned very much on behavioral science to really try and understand what drives human behavior and how do people make decisions and how do we kind of use this knowledge to, 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 to use this code to help shape the environment for which we operate. And so very new, unique in its design. But what was quite interesting to learn through the process was just how passionate people are on this particular topic. So, of course, we had a code of conduct in the past and there was nothing wrong with our code of conduct. But we wanted something more. We wanted something that lived up to the aspiration that we had for the culture transformation that the organization was under. And so we went to develop something very, very different. And we ended up with a product that was very, very different. So, yes, it, it's a document, but it's more than a document. It, it's actually something that now helps us shape the environment which we all create across all of the different functions and which which makes us the organization that we are. To maybe just pause and reflect and think about, is what I'm doing helping our associates do the right thing because that's what they want to do? Or is there an opportunity to continue to evolve and enhance that? So as I said, we launched the code in September. It took us roughly a year to develop it, but we're still very much on the beginning of the, the journey to really embed this into the way that we operate, because I, I believe that everyone comes, just like myself and, and yourselves, to work, to do the right thing. Organizations need to make it easy for people to do that. And, and Stephen, I think this links really nicely to what you're saying about the behavioral science piece. I think there's a lot that we can learn from behavioral science, which can help us, um, help us maybe rethink some of the things that we've done in the past. Okay, Derek, I think, uh I read you are a lot of speakers, uh, speakings in, in you know, the documents. So especially one I, it strike me. So how you persuade those CEOs to connect the purpose with profit, you know, with, with you know, to conv convince him that in, in, and also persuade investors, especially investors may not agree with some of the things for purpose and not making money. How, what, how you persuade those investor groups that, you know, purpose is a good thing to do? Right. No, it's, it's a great question. Uh, and it's one we do hear from time to time. And we think yeah. we do it in, in, a, in a few different ways. You know, one has been the research that we've done, which is just out. It's called Return on Purpose. You can get it at ccp.co. And it really says that companies that are purpose-driven, high-purpose-driven companies outperform low-purpose given uh, companies. But the key under that is over time. And one of the things we think that's really important is for people to think about the time frame. If your time frame is today, the planet will be probably fine, right? It's going to be okay. Everybody will be good. If you start to think about this over time, and that's really what most money is invested. The uh, average company in the stock market today, the vast majority, 95 to 98% of its value is yeah. its expected, discounted, risk adjusted future cash flows it's the future that we really matter so what are you yeah. doing today to get ready for the future and too mm -hmm. much of the the interest is around i would say short-term trading and i think that yeah. has been a bad thing um that's been like the mafia right short term i'll take care of this is my block not your block but how are we really going to build something that's going to be great and the big companies that are really interested in that so we really find that the research is really helpful a second area is time frame really critical these are not this is investment this is not trading the third area that we think really helps companies uh, see this is the case studies from other companies. The really successful companies that have won over and over again that outperform are ones who really stay focused in on that purpose, which has helped them build trust among their key stakeholders. So I think those three are really key, but time frame is one I think we sometimes miss. Great. So uh, I think we have a few minutes left. Everyone have a last thought. Is it Stephen? Would you mind like a... Can, Talk about a little bit for your, like, for example, behavior uh, scientists that related to uh, purpose, you know, how people behave because, you know, create a trust. Can you elaborate a little bit of there? And then after Steve, everyone maybe have last comments on, you know, the topics. Sure. Uh, well, look, I think I, I would summarize what, what we've all said here um, by looking at, trust as the real source of value in, in any, any enterprise. Um, if you think about 
what I said earlier, people have to have a sense that you're competent, reliable, honest, benevolent towards me. And then I'm ready to risk using your product. I'm, I'm ready to risk working for your organization. I'm ready to risk getting on your airplane. If, if you think about it, any, any business revenue is just trust monetized. And when you think about trust like that, it's all of a sudden not some squishy, soft topic, right? It is the basis of the future cash flows that Daryl was just describing. And so you really need to be investing in, in trust. And, and that becomes a, an operational question. Well, what does that mean? How do you invest in trust? And the way that you do that is you look at the relationships among employees in your organization and how they encourage one another to behave. We all like to think that we make our own decisions in our head about how we're going to act, but the data doesn't really support that. What behavioral science shows us is that we're a, an obligatorily gregarious species, uh, as it's been said. We're, we're social to the core, and we take our behavioral cues from our peers, and most particularly those who we trust most deeply, uh, for the simple reason that we need to remain a member of the tribe. If it will be, we'll be rejected and, and ostracized if we don't behave in a way that is in keeping with the norms of, of our trust uh, reference network. And so if you can understand that dynamic as it's playing out in an organization, it allows you to really anticipate what the behavioral proclivities of the organization are, and then you can project out as to what the impact will be for customers and society so that you can take corrective action proactively. And so that's why I think you know, the kind of work that, that uh, uh, Brett has described at, at Novartis uh, the kind of thinking that, that Daryl has described, and the sorts of companies that Sari is investing in, I think they've all sort of enlivened this idea in different ways, and it's exciting to see that. Yeah, great. For me, what's been interesting is, um, although one is working very, very hard, both on the concept and, and in developing the entrepreneurs and the team, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, setting a framework for culture at companies. And I find that even uh, with smaller companies and startup, there's certainly trust, but there's got to be a very healthy um, sharing culture uh, because there's such, the team is always very, you know, disparate. So, um, and that's what makes it a lot of fun and, and challenging at the same time. Great. Brett and Derek? Yeah, look, I think having a great sense of purpose attracts people to want to work for companies. And that, that's what attracted me, like this sense of purpose, this, this, this being able to contribute something bigger. And like this, I, I, I can't underestimate the value of this. This inspires curiosity in me every day. Um, it wants me, makes me want to lean in and contribute even more. It, it gives me drive. It gives me passion. Um, and, and that's why I stay. And so the more that companies can, like Sari and everyone said, tap into to the purpose and the greater good, I think this is where the opportunity really starts to come for companies to really live up to their full potential. Derek, yeah. you are in a business and sum up for our section, please. <laughs> sure, sure. No, and, and w wonderful, you know, the, the, the perspectives I think we've had at the, the high level of the essence of trust, how people have invested into trust and how do people make it happen on an individual company basis, right? It's such a yeah. great way to think about it. And I yeah. think in many ways, uh, purpose is the ultimate motivator, right? It really, that why, that reason for being really is what helps get us up in the morning in our ways. I think as we apply that to a corporate setting and business as a whole, it really has that ability to engender trust for, for folks in a way that hasn't happened before. Uh, and I think the Edelman trust barometer piece is it's, by the way, this is a journey. Trust mm -hmm. is hard to earn and easy to mm -hmm. lose. You can mess it up overnight. And we've seen so yeah. many companies do that. And that's why I think it's a challenge to really build that culture that Sarah talked about and that Brett is in, embedding within the organization. Because it doesn't take, it takes only a few people to really mess that whole thing up. But yeah. so we need to really create that culture to really build it. 
But I think today we really are looking at business as being the, the, the piece we can trust in a world that has been so decentralized through social media and other ways, but for business to be trusted. I mean, unfortunately, it's not government today and parochial politicians, right? It's businesses who have to think about it from a global perspective and really you know, represent that area. So in, encouraged, but we have to recognize this is a journey. It's been going on for thousands of years and it's uh, hopefully continued on for, for a while, but it really also is a chance as those expectations have risen risen for business to really step up to play a key key role through the investment through their their practices through the culture that they develop yeah thank you um thank you for you guys all get up so early and uh and, and share the great you know a great panel and you know is from different perspective uh i really enjoy and then you know i thank you and all thank you for the uh, our participants i think we have a great discussion from different perspectives and from different industries and this different expertise. And thank you for all of you and uh, uh, see you guys again in uh, later sections, some other uh, conference. Okay, thank you, you come to Beijing, thank you. come to Beijing to, 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 to check me out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye.